So the paper's called Gatekeepers, Engineers and Welcomers, and I hope it will become reasonable as I go on why it's called that. So I start with um, an anecdote that I heard at some Oxbridge high table. Apocryphally, the statutes of King's College, Cambridge, at one time included the following clauses. Statute 16b, no dog shall be permitted within the grounds of the college. Statute 61, for the purposes of these statutes, any pet animal belonging to the provost shall be deemed to be a cat. So that's the first um, bit to begin with. The second is this. Suppose three people sit and wait in a departmental meeting room, two professors and department secretary. And then a third professor enters the room, sits down, looks around and says, so we're only three people in this meeting. In my first example, we might say that the fellows of Kings consciously decided that for a certain particular purpose, their concept of a cat had in it a certain particular outward bulge. What we might see as a bulge that admitted the provost Jack Russell, allowing it to count as an honorary cat. And we might want to applaud their decision as superficially flippant, flippant but basically sensible, a way of dealing with a minor administrative difficulty. In my second example, we might say that the third professor acted on an unconscious decision, that for the purpose of departmental meetings, his concept of people had in it a particular inward, inward dent, what we might see as an indent, that excluded the departmental secretary, denying her the standing of a person who is present in the meeting. And this decision we might well want to decry as a piece of rude and obnoxious status mindedness, and also given the pronouns I've just been using, a piece of rude and obnoxious sexism. Here's a third example, and this comes from Richard Hare's well-known paper, Abortion and the Golden Rule. Hare says, Hare, Hare cites the example of a city park, perhaps he's thinking of university parks in Oxford, that has a sign that says wheeled vehicles prohibited. According to this piece of quite literal gatekeeping, what counts as a wheeled vehicle, we might ask? Cars, motorbikes and bicycles are definitely wheeled vehicles. Skateboards, Nordic skis customised for summer use with little wheels. You can see them going on the main roads in Switzerland sometimes. It's a truly bizarre sight, someone skiing along the main road from uh, Zurich to uh, to Geneva or somewhere using Nordic skis with wheels on the bottom. Segways, tiny wheeled fold up electric executive scooters. All of those probably count as wheeled vehicles, especially if furiously conducted. Park keepers wheelbarrows and sit on lawn mowers and wheelie bins almost certainly don't count as wheeled vehicles. Prams and wheeled suitcases and shopping trundlers and heelys probably don't count. Heelys, in case you don't know, are a type of trainers much favoured by small girls, which often come, therefore, in sparkly pink varieties. And heelys have small but functional wheels embedded in the heels of the soles, so the child can go back on her heels and um, scoot along instead of having to walk. The sight of heelys at pedestrian crossings is routinely terrifying. What about roller skates? Does the park sign cover them? Hare asks us to suppose that the case comes to court, where an adjudication is sought on the issue of roller skates. As he points out, the judge in this case may have very good reasons for public interest or morals for her decision, but she can't make it by any physical or metaphysical investigation of roller skates to see whether they are really wheeled vehicles. If she hasn't led too sheltered a life, says Hare, she knew all she needed to know about roller skates before the case came to court. And by the way, I've, I've mucked around with Hare's pronouns in that passage. Just to, just to show him. Now, Hare's point about road skates, he's making an analogy with the concept of a person that we might or might not want to use in philosophical discussion of abortion. And as a general point about that concept, if ever a concept was right for conceptual engineering of an ethically important kind, it's surely the concept of a person. The point that Hare's making is the world doesn't just give us a single uniquely authoritative way of deciding whether any beings born or unborn count as persons. To determine this question for the first time, whenever that was, or to reopen the issue at a later date, is to extend our concept of the person and or to argue about how to extend it and how not to extend it. And as with any concept, while there are clearly better and worse ways of extending it, no single extension can be straightforwardly read off the nature of things undeclared by judicious application of that large and painfully studied bludgeon called what science tells us, 
to be uniquely rational. So we, we don't get authoritative direction from the nature of things about what it is to be a person. Um, it's a matter for decision, and the way the decision goes is a question for us all to face together. So concepts in general um, don't follow directly from the nature of things. Um, does that mean that this is, is, is this supposed to be true of any concept? I think it is. Nietzsche famously says in the genealogy of morals that all concepts in which an process is semiotically concentrated elude definition, only that which has no history is definable. Um, Nietzsche's focusing, as his uh, book title shows, on evaluative concepts, but there's a plain sense in which there are no concepts, um, no human concepts at all that have no history. You can go to the library and find histories of our number concepts. Any of these will tell you how long it took for early medieval European minds, steeped as they were in the Platonic Aristotelian Christian tradition, to take seriously a notion already found in Ptolemy's Alma Guest and in Indian influenced Persian mathematicians like Al Khwarizmi, namely the notion of zero which comes to us, incidentally, from the Arabic as Sefer, by the Italian Sefiro. Zero is no solid reality, but a mere breeze in the empty air, a Zephyr. Um, there's some confusion in the linguistic history there. Zero is a Parmenides defying is not that is. It's a Euclid resistant number that is not any number. It's an amount of which Plato would surely say, but that amount is a non-amount, and you can't count a non-amount. So there was a conceptual transformation of European mathematicians of thinking once they got away from the kind of obstacles that Parmenides and Plato would have been inclined to put in the way of the notion of zero. In this conceptual transformation, the key figure was the great Italian, Leonardo Fibonacci, um, who lived, who died in 1250, and whose book of the Abacus, published at Pisa in 1202, was the that led to the general adoption of Arabic over Roman numerals, and so because of the death of the Arabic system, to the general use of zero in European mathematics. And here's a quote from Fibonacci himself. My father had me in my boyhood come to him in Bugia, in Algeria, and be instructed in the study of calculation. There I was introduced to the nine digits of the Hindus, though apparently decimal notation came from India originally. I realized that all calculations aspects were studied in Egypt, Syria, Greece, Sicily, and Provence with their varying methods. And at these places thereafter, I pursued my study in depth. But all this and the algorithm and the art of Pythagoras, I considered as almost a mistake compared to the methods of the Hindus with numerals. So embracing more stringently that method, the decimal method, and taking stricter pains in its study while adding certain things from my own understanding, and inserting also certain things from the niceties of Euclid's geometry, I have striven, striven to make this whole book, the book of the Abbasidus, as comprehensible as possible. Almost everything I've introduced, I've displayed with exact proof in order that those further seeking this knowledge with its preeminent method might be instructed and further in order that the Latin people might not be discovered to be without it. By the Latin people, he means, Fibonacci means the Italians and Dante uses Latin in the same way. If I have perchance omitted anything more or less proper or necessary, I beg indulgence, since there's no one who's blameless and utterly provident in all things. The nine Indian figures are 987654321. With these nine figures and with the sign zero, any number may be written. Now, what Fibonacci is proposing here is both a notational reform and his readers' ideas of number. Don't call it a merely a notational reform. It's not like saying that we just saying that we should put a bar through the waists of our sevens to distinguish them from our ones. The switch from Roman to it's a profound change in how we represent and manipulate them with enormous expressive potential, both mathematical theory and. So in his modest and unpretentious way, and quite without grand philosophical fanfare, Fibonacci is in this passage, his society's concept of number. And he's commendably open to the possibility that the conceptual revolution that he proposes is in some sense an incomplete revolution. He says both that he's made his book on number theory as rigorous as he knows how, and also that it may well be possible for future researchers to improve on the formality and cogency of his work. 
But for then actually then our concept and number is quite explicitly a work in progress. Given moreover that he's proposing a wholesale rethinking of that concept, he must also at least implicitly be open to the possibility that someone else might come along with a further rethinking of the concept to propose, as indeed has happened since, of course, several times, perhaps many times. The point here is an a fortiori. If that can happen even with our concept of number, or again with our concepts of space, time, and causality, think of the move from Kant to Einstein to Planck, then a fortiori, a change like that, can happen with our value concepts, and especially our political and ethical concepts. In fact, if it doesn't sound too we of gauche to think so, mathematical and physical concepts can be a relatively potent too. That was true of Fibonacci's discoveries, which transformed not only the mathematical, but also the economic thinking of his time. In the economics of our own time, as at least one cutting edge, there's been a veritable explosion in abstruseness that's directly reliant on the discovery or the invention, as you prefer, of new or relatively new mathematical concepts. If we didn't have polynomials, we wouldn't have pseudo-random functions. If we didn't have pseudo-random functions, we wouldn't have cryptography. If we didn't have cryptography, we wouldn't have Bitcoin. The basic point, the R4 theory here, is that even our basic mathematical and physical concepts can be and often are engineered or re-engineered to meet or supply new operations. If that can legitimately happen with them, then all the more so it can happen with our value concepts. A bit of an aside here on the very idea of regularities and irregularities in the application of a concept. Whether they're officially value concepts and whether or not we define them with if and only if formally with necessary and sufficient conditions, the respect of those two conditions is completely fixed in its content. Room for reform and change is built into our concepts, both of the open texture kind that the Wittgenstein of philosophical investigations is pointing to in his famous remarks about um, the notions of a game and family resemblance, and his remarks about the rule following um, of the kind that he's pointing to when he says that even with highly formalized concepts like plus, what counts as going on in the same way as before is determined at least partly by agreement in form of life, by a constitutive and at least largely inarticulable social agreement. In both contexts, the context of open thinking about open texture and the context of thinking about rule following, I think the debates have often run into the sand because of a failure to understand that both open texture and rule, rule following are constitutively diachronic notions. We're talking not about disengaged games of spot the difference or guess the next number, but about socially embedded understandings that develop over time within a wider diachronic historical context of the kind that McIntyre, Alistair McIntyre, calls a tradition, and also a context of the kind that everyone calls a society. Now, it's not necessarily always completely obvious what counts as going on in the same way with our concepts, nor connectedly with our rules, nor is it necessarily a manifestation of eccentricity when going on in the same way looks at least to some eyes like not going on in the same way, when there is in some identifiable respect what I started by calling a dent or a bulge in the extension of the concept. There is an identifiable thing that it is for verbs to be regular, or at least so. Though in fact, I doubt that there's any uniquely identifiable thing. The notion of irregularity in grammar is less determinate than we imagine. Still, by all accounts, not all verbs are regular. The aorist of the English to go is not goad. The imperfect of the ancient Greek lambno is not elambanon, but elabon. That's because English borrows the conjugation of a separate verb to wend to form the aorist of to go, though went is not regular either. And it's because the Greek lambano is one of those double new stems, lanthano, lanthano, tunthano, manthano, thingano, kindinuo, and so on. Again, chess isn't a less reasonable game than drafts, simply because the pieces don't all move in the same way, nor a less interesting one. On the contrary, we might say that the different rules for the different chess pieces thicken the plot. They are a principal part of the explanation why chess is a far better game than drafts. Tic-tac-toe is a, no, uh, checkers, as drafts is called in America. Tic-tic-toe is noughts and crosses, isn't it? Um, it's an even poorer game than drafts. To think that George, to think as George Bernard Shaw famously thought about English spelling, that irregularities are somehow a sign of irrationality, is to misunderstand what rationality is. 
rationality is not the same thing as rationalism. In certain cases, indeed, there are a few things less rational than rationalism, and this is one of them. In some circumstances, as with the offside law in football and the tackle law in rugby, we can improve a game, or we can try to improve it, by changing its rules in ways big or small. And in circ there are circumstances likewise where we can increase our heuristic power and our explanatory scope by re-engineering our concepts more or less ambitiously, either in the direction of regularity or in that of irregularity, depending on what, on what helps, on what works. To quote David Chalmers, philosophy has many aims distinct from discovering truths. Philosophy also aims to raise questions, to help us understand, to help us see the world differently, to live better lives, to improve the world, and so on. New and improved concepts certainly can help with those things. For example, once you have the concept of epistemic injustice, you see all sorts of old situations in a new way, and this can help achieve more just outcomes. Um, I'll, I'll just say as an aside on epistemic justice, there are some concepts which it is um, oppressive to have and to work with, and there are some concepts which is liberatory to have and to work with. So for example, um, it's a common feminist objection to uh, the concept of chastity, uh, that this is an oppressive concept, it's part of the patriarchy. It imposes upon women and not upon men, particular kinds of burden, social, moral, expectational, which are um, oppressive. Now, um, there's a rather good painting, one of my favorite paintings by a 19th century American artist, um, you, you may know the painting I mean, I don't know the title for it. It's a picture of a red-haired girl sitting on a train trying to read a book. And there's a bloke leaning over her shoulder while she tries to read and really getting in her face. Now, the point that I'm making is that in the society that that woman lived in, um, it's not clear to me, there may or may not have been, but it's not clear to me that there was such a thing as the concept of harassment. Having the concept of harassment can be liberatory for that young woman. She can under, come to understand that she is being sexually harassed by this bloke who's leaning over her shoulder and bothering her. Understanding her situation that way can be liberatory. Another liberatory concept that we can have is the concept of gaslighting. When um, I explain to you, as, as that bloke in the train carriage might explain to the young lady, he might say to her, oh, I'm, I'm just interested in seeing what you're reading. Um, I'm, I'm just trying to engage in friendly conversation, he might say. In doing that, he's gaslighting the young woman, because of course that isn't what he's doing. What he's doing is leering, prying, intruding, and threatening. And in pretending that those aren't the things he's doing, he's gaslighting her. For her to have the concept of gaslighting is for her to have the understanding that at times there are people who use their power um, not only to be abusive of other people, but also to feed to the, those whom they are abusing the information that what they're doing is not really abuse at all, they're perfectly entitled to do it. So the gaslighting concept is a concept which is liberatory once we possess it, along with sexual harassment. And here's a third concept, which I think is liberatory, the concept of epistemic injustice itself. Um, one of the great things about Miranda Fricker's project, I think, is that she's shed light on the fact that there is such a thing as um, testimonial injustice when people refuse to hear you because of um, because of who you are they won't listen to what you're saying in all the different ways in which epistemic injustice is inflicted 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 and inflicted its inflections are all ways of silencing people um telling them that they they don't count as uh, recounters of stories as retailers of fact, um, or telling them that what they're saying um, is is not really properly understood by them themselves. That's the other kind. That's herm hermeneutical injustice. Understanding things in the light of those concepts can be liberatory. Um, so epistemic injustice, the concept of epistemic injustice, is itself a means to writing um, epistemic injustices, as Chalmers says here. Now, we do with concepts in the way of revising them or um, rethinking them can be widening or can be narrowing. Not every widening of a concept is an improvement in that concept, probably enough. To take a specific example, it was clearly a good thing 
when doctors narrowed down from the use of an accurate concept of disease, um, the bloody flux, which was a concept the doctors had in, say, Jacobean times, when they narrowed down to more precise and more usefully scientifically networked concepts, like gastroenteritis, like food poisoning, like burst peptic ulcers, that, was, that narrowing down was a good thing. And indeed, the abandonment of the concept of the bloody flux was a good thing. If anything, the bloody flux is an old-fashioned name um, for a symptom, namely your shitting blood. Um, and that in itself doesn't explain too much. Concepts do need edges if they're um, to be any use at all. A word that can mean anything at all is a useless one. So um, as concepts broaden out, um, some concepts narrow down, some concepts broaden out. With the ones that broaden out, um, it's certainly the case that concepts need edges. And so a worry that we hear about concepts that widen out um, is, but then it goes. We hear people say that if you broaden out the concept, then it will cease to do any useful work because it can mean anything. Um, that's a familiar form of protest against some sorts of proposal for conceptual change. You hear this about uh, proposed extensions of the concepts of man and woman. Um, this is what's going on, I think, when people complain, oh, well, if just anyone can claim to be a man or a woman, then we are completely lost. We don't know where we are. Um, such anything goes, protests um, don't have any bite in other concept, contexts. Um, consider changes in the offside law. You might make it the case that it now has, to, you're, you're offside. Um, in the offside law, it's, it's a matter of there being three defenders in position, not two as before. Um, does that mean that anything goes? Of course it doesn't. Or think about irregular linguistic inflections. Um, with an invented language like Tolkien has this elvish language, Cinderin, um, and pluralization in Cinderism, Cinderin often happens through vowel shift. So orod is the singular, mountain in Cinderin, and the plural is ered, um, as in ered lithui, the mountains of mist on the borders of um, on the borders of the, the great wilderness. But what if we wanted to have ered itself as a word, you might say, um, we can't do that because it's already a plural. You might have qualms about that kind of thing, but then you might have the same qualm about the English word mice. What if you want to use mice as a singular in its own row, right, rather than being the plural of, of, of maps? What if you want to use geese as a word in its own right? Well, um, there is a rational distance here between things, between um, inflections not being entirely regular and absolutely anything going. Um, and it's important to remember that there is that distance between not entirely regular and anything goes in the face of glib rhetoric about how we can't use a concept at all if we broaden it out just a little bit. Of course, more inclusive isn't automatically better. Still, it's very common to find our political and ethical concepts improved by widenings of their scope and worsened either by narrowing or by an insistent refusal to countenance any widening. The authors of the American Declaration of Independence wrote that all men are created equal. Many of them were notoriously slaveholders themselves. So when they wrote that, they clearly didn't mean black men. Their concept of men had an indent and excluded black people. They didn't mean women either, though they no doubt were in the habit of using what's sometimes called the inclusive sense of men. Nor to note the third implicit exclusion did Jefferson and his colleagues, when they wrote the Declaration of Independence, really mean by men to include babies and children, who were no doubt equal with each other, but certainly not of the same status as male adults. This third exclusion perhaps makes less comfortable reading than the first two, since where children are concerned, we ourselves are very likely to make something like the same exception in our practice, if not our profession. We still have um, a, an implicit sidelining of children in the way we talk about human beings. There are even philosophers, um, such as Peter Singer, who are capable of saying that a person isn't, sorry, that a baby is an abnormal case of a human being. Um, that's a remarkable use of abnormal, I think. The point for present purposes um, is that man is an ethical and political concept. Um, I think that's an obvious truth when you think about it, as is person, a concept we also use. It's a thick ethical concept, and it is wide open to the possibility of conceptual engineering. So, so likewise, 
American and Scott. You can get a, a feel for the ethical thickness of American when you hear the president walk up to the dais for the State of the Union address or whatever and say, my fellow Americans. In saying that, he is addressing those who are citizens in the same polity by means of an ethical concept. Um, think also of the, the term un-American un or anti-American. There is something specific, behavioral and dispositional to do, which is what being un-American is. So here too, we're dealing with thick ethical concepts. Likewise with German and Jew, in chapter two of knowing what to do, I was talking about the moral imagination and about how we imaginatively frame other humans when we meet them. And I mentioned Hitler's question about the Jews he met in 1910, in 1910's Vienna. Hitler asked of the Jews he met, is that a German? And his answer was that they were not just Germans of another religion, they were a separate nation. But it was possible for people in Hitler's day to take a quite different attitude to the concept of Germanness. And um, I have a case in knowing what to do of someone who does exactly that. Um, with the concept of Jewishness, um, which is when um, the young Patrick Lee for more meets um, a of apparently nomadic Jewish people in the mountains of Romania, and instead of dismissing them from humanity, um, as Hitler does, he, he is deeply interested in them as beings and as the particular kinds of beings that they are. So in all this passage, I am pursuing the idea of thick ethical concepts, ethically thick concepts, having a much more wider um, frequency, a much greater frequency in our talk than we perhaps recognize. There isn't a clear limit between the ethical concepts and the non-ethical concepts, nor is there a clear division between the thick concepts and the thin concepts. All the time we find ourselves dealing with different kinds of often ethically potent thickness in our concepts. And I think this is a good thing. And I think it also displays something of the ways in which when we talk about conceptual engineering, um, it's not, it, there can be a very wide range of concepts which are up for that engineering, including concepts that we might have thought were um, extremely safe from such activities. Um, in thinking about what it is to be German, American or Jewish or Scottish, we're thinking about um, how we want our concept to look, how we want our concept to go, what kind of ethical implications we want it to have. And Hitler said something like this too. He, he didn't, of course. Um, he went the worst way possible to go, but he could have said something like, Germans are all those who want to be Germans. And that would have been a way of thinking about Germanness that would have given his nationalism a quite different shape and a healthier one, um, including a logically healthy. Um, there's nothing necessarily viciously circular about saying that Germans are all those who want to be Germans. Germans are all those who want to be Germans can be parsed, can be understood as meaning there's historically a tradition of what it is to be German, and it's part of that tradition that is open to anyone who wants to, to become part of that tradition themselves. This may be recursive, but it's not viciously circular. And we can compare um, what's been going on in Scotland recently about the concept of Scottishness. Um, and I'm, I'm very party pre in talking about this because I'm an English born person who has become a Scot, um, as well, I identify as a Scot at any rate, um, over time, if, if I had the opportunity to take out Scottish citizenship, I would do it in a flash. Over time, I've been living here since 1998. Over time, I've come to regard myself as a member of this nation. Although, as you can hear, I don't have a Scottish accent and I wasn't born in Scotland nor brought up there. And at times, um, the concept of Scottishness, of being a Scotswoman, has looked like it cannot apply to me. At times, the Scottish independence movement certainly has harbored a kind of blood and soil nationalism, a rhetoric of racial and historic exclusiveness and gatekeeping and purity tests that is disturbingly reminiscent of some other nationalisms, including the one we all know about in 1930s Germany. But it hasn't been like that recently. Um, the last generally visible sign of a gatekeeping attitude about Scottishness, it's a bumper sticker that you used to see um, when I first moved to Scotland, 
and I'm glad to say you don't see it anymore, I'm a real Scot from Dundee, this bumper sticker would say. On this account of what it is to be Scottish, there's no real prospect that anyone might become Scottish. By your birthplace or your parentage or both, you're born Scottish or not, you don't and can't become Scottish, and any attempt to become Scottish or to announce that you now identify as Scottish is strictly self-defeating. If you really were Scottish, you wouldn't need to claim to be. And apparently, if you are a Scot, but not a real Scot, then in the eyes of the maker of that bumper sticker, you are, with painful literality, a second-class citizen. And there used to be a mild but near universal paranoia about this whole business of being a Scot when I first lived in Scotland in 1989. This insecurity about identity seems to be there in the bumper sticker itself. If you're a real Scot, then why do you need to protest about it so much? And I think there's been a big improvement in the dominant concept of Scottishness. The attitude to Scottishness that we have now is summed up by saying that it's not about where you come from, it's about where you're going. It's not about stags and unicorns and tartan and bagpipes and blood and soil and all that jazz. A Scot is anyone on this new account, anyone who identifies with Scotland enough to make their home here and to seek to join in the project of building a new nation together. So the concept of Scottishness isn't at all racial or cultural gatekeeping, it's an inclusive and welcoming idea. And that means that it's entirely possible for me, born and bred in England, and of England, and with an accent mostly in between Lancashire and received pronunciation, to decide one day that from now on, I as Scot. So I would now say that I identify as Scottish and I'm proud to do so, that the concept of Scottishness covers me, despite my stereotypical origins and demeanour. Does that make me a fraud? Am I an imposter? Should we say biology matters or genealogy matters, and that I'm ignoring or deluding myself about the genealogical facts? Should we say that being Scottish isn't a feeling? You can't ground objective nationality in subjective feelings, that I'm basing on mere emotional attachment what can only be based on history and breeding. Am I an implausible failure because I don't look in enough like a Scot? I don't pass as a Scot. I don't sound like a Scot. I haven't had voice coaching to give my voice that familiar Caledonian lilt. At any rate, I don't sound like a stereotypical Scot. Am I a cultural entryist diluting and corrupting historic Scottish culture? Should real Scots feel flooded or overwhelmed or pushed to breaking point by Scots like me? Am I fetishizing a crude, cheap stereotype of pantomime Scottishness, which is itself part of the historic oppression of true Scots? Am I, by being Scottish, telling other Scots what it is for them to be Scottish? Must I fail to count as a Scot because I've not had myself a lifelong enculturation as a Scot, and so I can't appreciate for myself the full depth and reality of Scottish oppression and anti-Scottish prejudice? Or again, is the whole idea of Scottishness of any nationality, a historic relic that we should abandon in favour of an austerely global cosmopolitanism, should we be about abolitionists about Scottishness, thus cutting the ground from under the feet of those like me who want to say that they have come to be Scottish? You can't say that because Scottishness and non-Scottishness have been abolished. Must we say that I and those who think like me define Scots simply as those who self-identify as Scots and so are trapped once again in a circularity? I suppose consequences like those might follow if we were sufficient that the only acceptable concept of Scottishness is blood and soil. But on any more inclusive concept of Scottishness, it seems to me the answer to all the rhetorical questions that I just raised is one and the same. You're talking pure blether. It's a load of nonsense. So, um, as you may have noticed, in all that talk about the concept, of Scottishness, I wasn't talking only about the concept of Scottishness, there was an implicit analogizing going on between a kind of gatekeeping that might happen about being Scottish um, and about people like me who want to come to identify as Scottish. And another thing which certainly happens, which is gatekeeping about the concept of women, um, and which is meant to exclude people like me who say that we've been on a journey um, at the end of which we want to, we, we come to understand ourselves as people who ought to identify as women, who's, as people who do right to identify as ourselves as women, and we'd be making a mistake if we didn't say that. So um, all the rhetorical questions I asked, as you probably noticed, have their analogues. Thinking about 
the concept of woman and indeed about the concept of man, although it is fairly characteristic of trans exclusionary activists that they, they treat trans women as dangerous predatorial entryists, um, whereas they treat trans men as merely deluded poor dears. There is that, that kind of um, asymmetry in their treatment of us trans women and trans men. But anyway, someone who combines an exclusiveness about Scottishness with a protestation that their view of what Scottishness is depends only on the objective facts. That doesn't look like an innocent move or made by an innocent investigator. Actually, the combination of views in question seems decidedly disingenuous. Decisions about how to define Scottishness are not determined solely and completely by some set of mutual worldly facts. They're determined also by how inclusive we want to be. We might even say that this willingness to welcome rather than gatekeep is the decisive factor. If that willingness is in place, then all sorts of theoretical options for a greater or lesser degree of conceptual engineering about Scottishness are left open. But in a sense, it barely matters which way the theory goes and what the deep metaphysics of Scottishness is that we want to construct. I'm a little skeptical about how much that actually matters, just as by analogy, I'm a little skeptical about a lot of the projects, um, the metaphysical projects that I've seen in progress about um, what gender identity is. Maybe there is something that gender identity is. I'm not convinced that there needs to be anything that gender identity just as such is in order for us to make sense of at least most of what at least many trans people want to say about themselves. Um, however, the metaphysics goes, the key thing I think is not the theory, but the inclusiveness. And that's true both with Scottishness and also with um, trans women and trans men. I'm reminded here a little of famous debates in the early church about how to provide a theological justification for extending the, the Christian covenant, the new covenant to the Gentiles from the originally Jewish first believers. To tell the truth, I want to suggest, it wasn't actually crucial how the church's leaders justified this extension, just so long as they found some way of justifying it. So as I say, in all of this, I'm talking about um, an analogy, and I hope I've at least given some clarity on why I'm happy to say both. I'm an English Scot, an English Scot really, really, English Scots really are Scots, and also I'm a trans woman, and trans women really are women. And so um, I'll sum up at this point, because we've reached three o'clock. Let me um, draw three conclusions from what I'm saying. So there's been a great deal of noise and palaver and indeed unpleasantness in recent years, particularly since um, the British government uh, found itself needing fresh distractions from the failure of its Brexit project in about 2017. It's become curiously um, hellish to be a trans person in Britain. We've suddenly become the object of a great deal of, of media attention. As I say, I think this is essentially distractionism. Um, but there's nothing particularly special and nothing particularly wildly worrying or even innovative about the notion of submitting the concepts of woman and man to conceptual re-engineering in order, amongst other things, to make the social world a more welcoming place for and a less gatekeeping place against transgender and gender incongruent people. Conceptual changes of this sort happen all the time, all over the place, to all sorts of concepts. That's the, the takeaway, the first takeaway from this paper. So if I have any objection to manifestos for the philosophical program of conceptual engineering, the main one is that no manifesto is needed simply because conceptual engineering is already here and always has been here. It's pervasive in philosophy and has been at least since Plato's time. So conceptual changes can be, and sometimes are, both socially and conceptually progressive, and when they are, they're unambiguously for the better. And this has been going on since forever. So there's no courage, therefore, in trying to object to conceptual revisionism about man and woman, simply because it's revisionism. There's nothing sacred about the concepts we currently have or had, or about concepts that something called the tradition had. Um, the traditionalism that you get in a lot of trans-exclusionary rhetoric is um, very striking. This, this appeal backwards to a kind of 1950s dream world in which men were real men, women were real women, um, little boys were real little boys, little girls were real little boys, and real, real little girls 
and everyone had a perfect all American barbecue in the backyard. And there was no ambiguity then. There were none of these gender ambiguous people. There were none of these problems back then. Um, well, anyone who knows any actual history of the 1950s is not going to buy this picture. But there is this, um, um, I suppose you might call it um, Walton's traditionalism in the air, parking back to an alleged golden age in which there weren't any trans people, apparently. Um, and this is um, as silly as such a traditionalism would be anywhere else. The idea that we're somehow necessarily stuck with the concepts we, we've got or that we recently had or that our parents had, and that those concepts are unalterably just there, that accepting them is accepting obvious facts, rejecting them as buying into some ideology. We often get that offered to us as if it were an obvious truth, but it's neither obvious nor in fact a truth. And the offer is usually disingenuous. The idea that there's something automatically enlightened and correct about some past piece of um, ordinary language um, is related, and it well deserves to be called by the rude name that Bertrand Russell gave it, the metaphysics of the Stone Age. And last takeaway from what I'm saying, what I've said leaves it wide open exactly how revisionary we want to be about gender concepts. Some approaches to gender concepts, like Sally Haslanger's, propose wholesale reforms. Such approaches aren't ruled out by anything that I've said here. Um, we can talk about Haslanger in discussion. Um, my own uh, I'm on a quite different um, philosophical bus from her. Um, I, I don't think that I buy her proposed definitions of man and woman to oppression. Um, of course, there is oppression in the end. I, like many other critics of Haslanger, find myself wanting to say, well, sure, oppression is a thing, but do we really want to say that if there were no oppression, there would be no men and women? Do we really want to say that um, it's necessarily the case that oppression puts men in, in one role and women in the other? How, on that account, for a start, do we ascribe, do we do we properly describe matriarchal societies? Can we use the concept of man and woman to describe matriarchal societies? Well, I think we can, but um, if Haslang is right, then we can't. Or if we do use them to describe that society, then we have to say that they're not matriarchal. They're just a different form of patriarchy, which, which seems to me pretty wild. Um, we can talk about that further in discussion. Um, it's up to us how revisionary we want to be about gender concepts. Um, I don't want to be as revisionary as Haslanger. Perhaps I don't want to be very revisionary at all. Um, the adoption analogy, uh, which I talk about, you're, you're looking, by the way, the shared screen is the, uh, the current typescript of the book in progress. Um, the adoption analogy is part four of the book in progress. So as far as I can see, we hardly need to change our concept of parents very much at all to accommodate adoptive parents. I mean, we might change our concepts in the process of accommodating them, but we might also say parents are still defined as biological progenitors. But the existence of adoptive parents doesn't change that definition. They just stand as by your leave or honorary parents, if you like, it as an exception that proves the rule. And that's close to what happens in the case I started with, the case of the Provost of Kings, Jack Russell. And I intended that case to warm up and as a joke. But my serious view about it is that it would be overblown to say that the college's statutes really define, really redefine the concept of cat. It'd be much nearer the mark to say that what they do is establish a local legal fiction. We might say that the existence of trans women and trans men doesn't actually change the existing definitions of women and men. There's nothing whatever for a trans inclusive philosopher to object to if someone wants to define women and men as adult females and males respectively. Um, and I've, I've just been wishing some hostile journalist would get me on the radio or on um, GB News or something and fire this supposedly gotcha question at me. Um, how do you define women and men? Well, I define them as adult females and adult males. And there's no problem about that. And I think that has no impact at all on what we want to say about trans women and trans men, just as defining a parent as a biological progenitor has no impact at all on what we want to say about adoptive parents. Um, it's just that um, adoptive parents are, if you like, 
honorary parents, that perhaps that isn't a phrase to use very much um, for reasons I'll come to in a minute. Perhaps in the same way trans men are ordinary men, trans women are honorary women. Um, a reason not to say that is because of the notion of an honorary white, which we get in South Africa, which runs the whole notion of honoriness that we're talking about. Um, I don't want to go in for apartheid style racial segregation, obviously enough, and therefore I don't have any use for the notion of being an honorary white. Um, the situation, so, so perhaps we shouldn't use that phraseology, but the basic idea of why you leave inclusion into a fire, as happens with adoptive parents, um, that seems to me to be a useful idea to apply when thinking about trans men and women. So um, I suppose that raises the question in closing, whether if we go just to the adoption analogy, we're um, conceptually engineering anything at all, well, I think we are, at least to this extent, um, that allowing adoptive parents to be parents is admitting to the notion of a parent a kind of disjunction. Um, parents are either biological progenitors or they're adoptive uh, parents, parents who stand in the role of biological progenitors. Um, very often, you don't even need to mention that, that disjunct because it isn't all that important for a lot of purposes that you should mention it. What is it is important to mention where is a political matter. And um, so one, one thinks of schools here, of schools which um, talk very carefully in their, their letters, which would before have been called letters to parents. They're now called letters to parents and other carers. What it matters to mention in what context is a political matter. But there can be cases where it does no harm simply not to mention. Um, an indentation in a context. Um, so the, the point is not um, whether uh, any of these ways of thinking, suggesting here is the right, definitively the right way to think about our gender concepts. The point is merely that we're canvassing possibilities and lots of other possibilities exist besides the ones I've canvassed here. So there are lots of options for conceptual engineering about our gender concepts. Um, the possibilities are wide open. And to react to that prospect with defensiveness and fear seems to me to be uh, irrational and unwarranted. Um, I think this is an exciting moment for us to live in. And I see no reason to be afraid of the prospects before us. Thank you. <laughs>